Uh, I grew up, I was born and bred in Brooklyn. I went to Midwood High School and I went to Brooklyn College, undergraduate. Got an excellent education there. Uh, I went to uh, Columbia for my master's, which I, in which I majored in microbial genetics. And by the time I got my master's, I had two children. And um, I did that rather fast. And I decided that I could not go on for my doctorate, although I had received an NSF uh, fellowship to go through to my doctorate from the start, but I, um, I stopped at the master's because family and full-time education was impossible. I waited to go on for my doctorate until my youngest of my three children went off to college. So I finally got my doctorate, and this was at State University of New York in Binghamton, in limnology, I got my doctorate in 1980. And in between, I was doing research all that time. I was extremely young and I did not know what science was, but I was dissecting birds at a rather young age. And prior to that, I, from the time I was in second grade, I was growing seeds that were available for a penny a packet from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Um, and I remember uh, my, my first harvest uh, was a radish, which I divided up in <laughs> five pieces with the entire bunch of my family. And then uh, we owned a children's camp and I was very involved in the na in nature study there so that that was the formal kind of education that I had which made it very attractive to be involved to become a naturalist in essence so that was early um, education in terms of formal education in high school I um, I was part of the research section in high school in Midwood High School it was a Mr. Rabinowitz who was in charge of the biology lab and I did experiments of some sort with um, Drosophila and I learned that ripe bananas were, if I could spare them from my lunch, it was excellent food for my Drosophila. Um, that was the beginning of my science experience. And then at Brooklyn College I uh, took invertebrate zoology and I had really excellent professors who guided me. It was really a very excellent education which for many years Brooklyn College then went downhill but now I think that is again an excellent educational space and of course it's part of the City University of New York but at that time it was independent. I went to work at uh, Maimonides Hospital and while I was working there I became pregnant um, and I um, I was at the time, and this is kind of funny, I was taking an embryology course and um, actually the baby was born <laughs> in May before we had our final. Uh, but that gave me a good background for what I wanted to do in graduate school. Um, I, the baby was eight months old when my husband saw an article in the paper, I mean, this gets me into the proper sequence. Uh, my husband saw an article in the paper and he said, hey, I bet you could do this. Um, this was the very beginning of the National Science Foundation fellowships and um, there were exams being given 
and I could go back to Brooklyn College and take the exam if my mother took care of the baby. My husband was working. And so I did that. I dropped the baby off at my mother's house, which was near Brooklyn College, and I went and I took this exam. And that's how I got the fellowship. And I was the only person, the only biologist from my class who won the fellowship at Brooklyn College. And I was the only one in my class, the entering class at Columbia, which is where I took the fellowship. Um, I was the only one who, who received the fellowship. When I graduated from Columbia, I went to work at Haskins Laboratories, and there was an opportunity that was funded by Pfizer Drug Company um, to work with rotifera, the rotifers, uh, developing them as biological tools, just as, um, say, E. coli is used uh, to study the levels of vitamin B12 in, um, in a medium. That was the objective, was to get rotifers, which are multicellular little animals. Um, they, they've got, I think God tried out everything. Well, Mother Nature tried out every system of reproduction, all different types of, uh, of organ systems. They're very complex little things the size of protozoa. So actually, I moved my laboratory for certain periods. I said to them, when I had the third baby, I, I, I said to the people at Haskins, um, I'm not coming in anymore because it's just too complicated and I am just torn apart taking care of the children and going off to the lab. So they said, what do you need? We'll give you the kind of pay that you need to cover child care for the second child and for the third child. What do, you, what do you need? And we'll set you up. And they gave me microscopes and I had a laboratory at my home in Teaneck, New Jersey, first in Manhattan in an apartment. And then we moved to Teaneck, New Jersey. And I set up a simple lab where um, I knew perfectly well how to make things sterile and to cultivate what I needed cultivating. So I had, uh, say, a stove with a pilot light. And that turned out to be just perfect for incubation time. And then I had a pressure cooker, which I had been given as a wedding present, and I didn't really use it too much for cooking. And I, uh, I was able to use the pressure cooker for sterilizing. And in the oven, I would wrap up my Petri dishes, like a sandwich. And I, I learned very good sandwich technique by learning standard, standard Petri dish wrapping uh, systems. And I would uh, sterilize the pipettes in standard pipette containers in the oven. Uh, every, everything was handleable at home. And my oldest child would help me, uh, and he still remembers quite clearly, and he's now <laughs> 60, he remembers quite clearly that he would do part of the photography when I was taking pictures to capture information about my rotifers. And I would bring my oldest to the lab with me when it was necessary. Oh, okay. My, I first came to Woods Hole, to the MBL, before most of this story that I've told you, right after college. <clears throat> I married, and many of my friends, men, came to the MBL. And so, for our honeymoon, we came here and spent a week. And uh, my friends got us into the dining hall. And uh, that was when the old mess, old main was still here. The old mess, mess hall was here. And um, so I, I had applied, by the way, to the MBL when I was in high school. I applied to every summer laboratory that I could at the age of 
14, 15, 16. I had that little notebook where I was recording all of the places. Homer Smith I applied to, and I didn't get an answer from anybody who paid attention to high school kids. So I, I didn't have that experience if I had had parents who were here, but they, you know, this was not home for me at the time as it is for my children and grandchildren. Here, I always was able to fit in as a scientist. I would fit in at whatever level I was. I'm doing, say if I was doing research in rotifers, then uh, other people would talk to me about rotifers and I could attend the courses. But I found that my husband made wonderful friends here. They're still our closest friends are all Woods Hole people and outside of music that is for him and eventually he became very involved and that, that made a lot of difference. Uh, he became very involved in helping the MBL. Well, uh, he brought Jean-Pierre Jean Paul to the MBL for its was it the 100th anniversary? Uh, and he wrote a work for two flutes, and the two flutes were Jean-Pierre Paul and Yella Atima, and, uh, and a string quartet. And it was really quite delightful. I mean, it, was, it, it created a great hubbub here, and it also was a good fundraiser for the MBL because there were sensible people dealing with it. Although they didn't have experience in running concerts, they found that they could charge for the rehearsals of Jean-Pierre and Paul. And there were people around the block to get into that rehearsal and then sold out concert for, uh, for this work. Then also, once my husband became, in 1989, once my husband became the dean of the School of Music at Yale, he was able to bring concerts. First, he brought the Tokyo String Quartet. Every summer, except maybe for one or two, they were able to come, and because he had this personal relationship with them, um, they would make the time available, even though their, uh, their agent said, no, 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 you can't do this. They said, we're doing it. So at any rate, my husband became a real part of it. And that, uh, that made a lot of difference to allowing me to have the summers here, because otherwise it wouldn't have worked. When, when we did come here, my children were already of science school age, which is a great support. And when my children were young teenagers, and so that this was in the 70s, I guess, and the late 60s and the early 70s, I was uh, on the Food Housing and Daycare Committee. And I think I told you about this, Ann Stewart was chair, she became the chair, and uh, she said, we, we have to do something. First I'll, I'll tell you about daycare, but then I'll tell you about food. Uh, she said, we have to do something about child care. And at that time, my children were teenagers, and um, so I didn't need child care, but I had had the experience where there was no child care available. There was just no question of without paying for help, there was no question of my being able to have the children taken care of during the summer. Um, and so I saw that only part-time care was available because there were various facilities available at, in, in Woods Hole and in Falmouth but there was no full-time professional daycare available. And so we established the um, Woods Hole Daycare Cooperative, the MBL Daycare Cooperative. We first started in the brick dorm, 
uh, and the, in the, the apartment house. We had our first uh, daycare there. And then we moved into the house that's just opposite um, Swope. Once we convinced the powers that be, that, that were, that this was a legitimate function, daycare was a legitimate function of certainly uh, of the laboratory much as much as um, the club, the MBL club, and the tennis courts, and the f swim facilities. Taking care of children was part of our function. From my Rotifer work, um, which I was doing almost as a hobby when I came up here, um, I, I was working at Haskins Laboratories, and I came up for a few weeks to uh, some, somebody's private bungalow became available. Friends told me about it, and we came up for our vacation here. And I had just been to uh, the National Seashore. It was part of our vacation, and I had seen this fascinating cedar swamp. And I had read that rotifers would be found in acid swamps. And so that was just known. And uh, from the porch of the house that we rented, I was birding, because I always had binoculars, I still do. And I was sitting on the porch and I said, that looks like a cedar swamp. My husband said, it looked like a lot of dead trees out there. That's just a dead forest, at which my daughter started to weep. And she said, that is not dead. That is a live swamp, <laughs> because we had just been to uh, the National Seashore. And so we went traipsing into the swamp, and I found a really good source of rotifers. So, uh, because in a, they, they weren't commercially available, uh, you had to find everything for yourself. And um, so this started my interest in cedar swamps. This is oh, I guess a few years before I went for my doctorate. And uh, that's how I started working in Cedar Swamps as, as a hobby, because at the time I was just looking for rotifers and working at Haskins Labs uh, studying rotifera. I had no official position and um, I just wanted to be able to do the research. And so I set up a lab at home. And, um, and that became the Swamp Research Center. And I had, would have a couple of assistants working for me. Sometimes my lab was located in MBL as I was sharing labs with other people as I was um, getting involved with uh, the EOL, the Encyclopedia of Life. While I was on the faculty at Yale, and that started in 1989, 1990, the semester in environmental science, or in ecological studies, I, I've forgotten what SES stands for, um, which is part of the Ecosystem Center at the MBL. Uh, people came to me and asked me if I would mentor the students, show them where to do research, and uh, just get them familiar with uh, Cedar Swamps as a potential research site, which I did. And when they wanted to pay me, I said, I want space in trade. And they had the space available for many years, and so Starting early on, um, I was able to have a laboratory under the wing of the Ecosystem Center.